All right, thank you, Frank, and good to see everybody here. Welcome to another week of our lecture series involving our community in this grand partnership. Again, as we do every week, we welcome you aboard, really proud to be part of a collaborative effort with the college, with our two wonderful museums here in town, bringing what we think is some of the very, very best educational program, as well as just a, just a wonderful fellowship, watching veterans work with veterans, seeing veterans work with our students in interviews, look forward to reading our student projects, which are due tonight, their interviews of veterans. That was a hint, they're due tonight. <laughs> Tonight's uh, program is sponsored in memory of Sergeant First Class Herschel Kidd. And we learned a little bit last year about Sergeant Kidd, how he actually rode the LST 393 to Italy and was a sniper. And like so many, many of the brave men of that era, contributed so much and paid the ultimate sacrifice. So just in beloved memory, and let's just take a quick uh, moment of thought there in silence, please. Thank you. And again, Sergeant First Class Herschel Kidd has all of our respect. If it doesn't snow by 7.15, Ron Janowski is going to uh, reenact or give us this Pearl Harbor story that was scheduled previously that was snowed out. And I think if we see Peggy Maniatis, we need to kind of push her out of the room because she has been the snow magnet for us. Assuming we continue that long without a foot of snow, then Peggy Maniatis will also be back here to talk to us about the U.S. Coast Cutter McLean and the role of the Coast Cutter in World War II. And I will finish up with a short introduction and kind of reaffirmation of the Battle of the Bulge. So we've got a full uh, presentation tonight. We're trying to work in some of the presentations that we lost due to weather. Why do we study? What's the purpose of studying something 70 plus years ago? And that's a hard sell often to young people, people of all ages. We've got a short little video that might remind us as to why we study. Three teens were arrested today for defacing the Kensington Park War Memorial overnight. The destruction includes painted messages against the military and the war in the Middle East. The three teens were picked up in the early morning Where, hours after evidence was left at the scene. Grandpa, something wrong? Some people sure have short memories. And those who are too young to know need to be taught. Come on, I, I want to show you guys something. Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. At dawn on the morning of the 6th of June, 1944, 225 Rangers jumped off the British landing craft and ran to the bottom of these cliffs. 225 came here. After two days of fighting, only 90 could still bear arms. These are the boys of Puente Lobo. These are the men who took the cliffs. These are the champions who helped free a continent. And these are the heroes who helped end a war. You are men who in your, quote, lives fought for life and left the vivid air signed with your honor. In the name of God and country, I learned to defy gravity. To honor my family, I lived in the belly of a beast. I fixed the hearts of iron monsters. I became a worm in the mud for dignity, for honor, for righteousness sake. For God and country, I fought for you. I fought for you. For you. I fought for you. I fought for you. For you, I fought for you. I fought for you. For you, for you, for you, for you.
for you. I fought for you. I fought for you. I fought for you, and I do it again. Very few people in this room need to be reminded of why we're here and what we're here to study. And I applaud the young students for enrolling in this class and learning in a non-traditional environment. I applaud everyone here for making our class our community. So really, we thank everybody here. Our next presenter, Lieutenant Colonel Ron Janowski. A wonderful background. I'd love to give you his entire resume. Except for, you know what, this is a lieutenant colonel, a West Point graduate. We know he's got a damn good resume. And <laughs> we don't need to know about that. We know that he has got a slew of degrees, tremendous awards, and was really one of our finest. So for that, we're glad to have him here. But there's a few things we might not know. One of his contributions here in Muskegon is the Junior ROTC program. And both in Muskegon and in Grand Rapids, he's been active working with young people in high school as reserve officer training. So it's just one of those nice programs that just to really take leadership, and that's something that I think we're very proud to have Ron in our community doing this. Leadership by example. Certainly West Point is just the absolute model of leadership by example. And Ron, being a product of West Point, has quite a bit of leadership by example for us. Rumor has it his students challenged him. Uh, actually, he challenged them. If they could recruit up to 10% of their high school class into the JROTC program, if they could, he would give the ultimate hair sacrifice by getting a complete shave. And thus, the students lived up to their end, and in the gymnasium, he was taken down, and all the students took turns cutting him, and I think we meet Ron in about 30 seconds. We're going to learn. It hasn't really grown back all that much, but I guess that comes with age. Please join me in welcoming Ron Janowski. I don't know where Kurt gets his information, but in fact, I have had my head shaved three times. My wife was behind the, she was the instigator twice, but we'll leave that for another time. Tonight, Muskegon Community College in conjunction, I do, fine, tonight, Muskegon Community College in conjunction with the Silversides Museum and the LST 393 is proud to invite you and welcome you to this winter seminar. Tonight's topic will be the awakening of a giant, the attack on Pearl Harbor. I am your host. I am Lieutenant Colonel Ron Janowski. As Kurt mentioned, I am a graduate from 1976 of West Point. I also am a 1998 graduate of the Army War College, and along the way I picked up degrees in systems management, a master's in systems management from USC. And just last year, in 2013, I earned my master's in uh, military history from Norwich University. I got to tell you, I've been doing ROTC now for 16 years. 
I was a veteran, and I'm the son of a World War II veteran. So I feel extremely comfortable talking with students, and I am incredibly honored to be in the presence of veterans. I'm telling you, it feels like home up here. Thank you. Before we dive into Pearl Harbor, I want to mention two items, two thoughts that I want you to have in the back of your mind as we talk about history. The first is, there is no event in history that happens independently. Regardless of what you may think or see or read, there is nothing that happens without having some event precede it and lay the foundations for it. And in the same sense, that event, that event leads to other events which feed from it. So I want you to have that in mind. The second item is this. History is more or less opinion. I'm sure many of us here tonight could talk about in great detail the assassination of President Lincoln. We could talk about what happened at Pearl Harbor. Now, with one, I could certainly imagine that there are people here who were alive at the time of Pearl Harbor. But in the same breath, I'm quite sure there's no one here that was alive at Lincoln's assassination. Everything we hear, everything we know, everything we learn about history is subject to someone having written it down, a human being written it down. And since we are all subjective in our view, our perspectives, that means that every bit of history that you have ever heard is someone's opinion. I want you to keep those, both of those thoughts in mind as we go through Pearl Harbor tonight. The fact that no event it operates in a vacuum. And second, everything you think you know is because someone else said it from their perspective. That plays into what we understand about Pearl Harbor. The Japanese attacked in that murky mid-day between day and night. Their torpedoes slamming into the Western-style warships with surprise, devastating the Western ships and shocking the world with the audacity of the yellow man attacking a great Western fleet. The date was not December 7th, 1941. It was, in fact, February 8th, 1904. And the place was not the American naval fleet in the Hawaiian territories, but in fact, the Russian fleet, the Grand Imperial Russian fleet, in the harbor of Port Arthur on what is today the Korean Peninsula. Now, you may be amazed by the coincidence. The fact is, it is not a coincidence. And in order for us to truly understand Pearl Harbor, we need to understand why Port, harbor, Port Arthur and Pearl Harbor were not coincidental in both Japanese and world history. Now to really understand this, we need to go back a little bit further. We need to go back at least another 15 years to about 1890 to this man. Any of you guys recognize this fellow? He's a rather influential man in naval history. His name is Alfred Thayer Mahan. Now, Admiral Mahan was an instructor at the U.S. Naval Academy. Interestingly enough, his father was an instructor at the U.S. Military Academy, where Alfred was born, hence the middle name. Thayer is a very famous name in West Point history. Alfred was born in West Point in 1840, but much as many young people do, he chose not to go the way of his father, but to slightly alter that, and he went through the Naval Academy, graduating just in time to serve in the Civil War in the Northern uh, Navy. Now, why does he have an impact on us as far as Pearl Harbor? Well, as the years went by, Admiral Thayer progressed through his career, a, a rather humble career, and ultimately in 1890, he was serving as a professor at the U.S. Naval Academy when he published his most important work called The Influence of Sea Power on History. 
In this, Admiral Mahan posited that the strength, the power, the very wealth of nations depends on their control of the sea, and more specifically, sea lanes, connecting the home country with its various colonies. Admiral Mahan did not come by this lightly. He had based his work upon his many years of studying naval history, from the classical Greek through the medieval into the Elizabethan period of England and all the way up to the modern American warship period of the Civil War that he himself had served in. The time of 1890 was a time of great change in the world. It was a time of empires. It was a time when nations of Europe, no matter their size, small in many cases, developed great power and great strength through the acquiring and the use of colonies throughout the world. These colonies provided both resources to the home country and markets for the home country to sell their goods. Nations as small as England, which is minuscule in comparison to, to larger nations, even the, the Dutch in Holland, created great wealth through their use of empires around the world. And in the 1890 time frame, this was at its peak as nations of Western Europe created these colonies all across the world, overlapping and nudging each other for shoulder space in grabbing all of this land to develop their power. It was this paradigm that Admiral Mahan saw and recognized and declared it was their use of sea power and the control of sea lanes that gave them this great authority and power in the world. Now, very little of this applied to the United States in 1890. But eight short years later, it suddenly did. On the 15th of February of 1898, an American warship in the harbor of Havana, Cuba, suddenly exploded. Mysterious, even to this day. But it was enough to precipitate the Spanish-American War, urged on by the yellow press. You guys have heard of the yellow press? The propaganda uh, that encouraged public opinion to the point of moving uh, American policy, moved the United States to declare war on Spain. And in a very, very short time, the Spanish-American War was concluded, and it signaled both the sunset of an empire, the Spanish, and the rising of a new empire, the United States. For with the Spanish-American War and the defeat of Spain, the United States now acquired land in Cuba, Puerto Rico, and the Philippines. All of a sudden, the United States was an empire. And all of a sudden, the writings and the theories of their home son, Alfred Thayer Mahan, made sense. The United States was ready to take action on the world stage as a true empire. As it happened, Mahan's readings were widely read, but especially read and especially uh, excited about it was a man who, in fact, fought in the Spanish-American War and soon found himself at the highest levels of government as he was vice president and then suddenly elevated to president with the assassination of William McKinley, Theodore Roosevelt. Whoa. Theodore Roosevelt was ready for action. 42 years of age, the youngest man to ever hold the office of president, he was ready to go out and put into play Alfred Thayer Mahan's very theories on an American scale. He quickly took measures to establish a strong Navy. He had served as an assistant naval secretary in the Department of the Navy. And he moved in and started building great ships. Between 1904 and 1907, he commissioned 11 new battleships for the American fleet and dressed out in their beautiful peacetime colors of white with gold trim, they were declared the Great White Fleet. Roosevelt was, one, was never one to hold back a good thing, and he sent the ships out on a worldwide tour, voyaging around the world from 1907 to 1909. 
establishing not only that the Americans had a great fleet, but they could deploy it worldwide and control those sea lanes, just as Mahan had said a great nation must. It's probably no coincidence that the ships stopped in the Hawaiian territories at Pearl Harbor to refuel. And it is certainly no coincidence that the ships went on to stop not only in the Philippines, but in Japan, to make known to the Japanese who were feeling their oats at that time, which I'll explain more in a few moments, to show the Japanese that the American fleet was battle ready and prepared to sail anywhere in the world to promote American interests. By 1900, the world was pretty well carved up as far as most of Africa, most of the Middle East, certainly India. The last great prize standing ready to be harvested by the colonists, by the colonial powers, was China. China represented the last frontier that would present itself as a territory for the colonies to be acquired by the various nations of the world. America wanted in on that territory. It doesn't take much, however, to see how distant China was. Certainly, one European country had a great advantage. That is Russia. Russia actually bordered China. In order to try to allay their advantage, there was an interest in courting Japan as a surrogate for the Western powers. Now, Japan certainly had its own interests as well, but they weren't taken terribly seriously, frankly. They were the little yellow men. It was not understood, it was not appreciated that they too might have aspirations of imperial might. But they did have a great desire to be like the West, and that made them useful as surrogates. Upon their opening to the West in the 1850 time frame, when Admiral Perry took, came into the harbor of Tokyo, the Japanese quickly assessed these strange, white, round-eyed men that came to visit them and their great war machines. The Japanese were quick also to assess there was no way that they could compete. So as they say, if you can't beat them, join them. And the Japanese soon began to acquire and sy synthesize Western ways into their own. Everything from technology, even to Western wear. The West recognized, and particularly Britain and the United States recognized, that the Japanese would be perfect as surrogates for American and British interests in the Far East to protect the American interests and the British interests in China against the incursion of the Russians who were so close, having border, borders with China. It was believed that by having the Japanese protect American interests, the Americans would have a better advantage to continuing to move into Japan at a later time. What became shocking was when in 1904, the Japanese bumped with the Russians enough that they declared war. And shock even, shocking even more, the Japanese won the Russo-Japanese War. The peace was, bar was brokered by Theodore Roosevelt in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. As you might expect, Roosevelt saw himself as something of a mentor to the Japanese, and so he felt compelled to look after his little brothers and broker the peace. The peace did not sit well with the Japanese for the very reason that when they stepped forward to claim the natural reparations that a victor normally gets from the vanquished, Roosevelt decided not to allow them to gain reparations, especially since the Russians refused. The Japanese don't really need that, Roosevelt thought. They were allowed to maintain their possessions in the, uh, in the Korean Peninsula, but reparations were withheld from them. They were considered less than a great power by the West, even yet. In the short years to follow, the colonial period and the empires clashed 
and finally broke in World War I. And from, 1814 to, uh, from 1914 to 1918, the West was consumed with World War I, leaving Japan more or less isolated in the far west, uh, far east. During this period from 1904 to about 1931, several generalizations can be made about Japan. First of all, they were rankled over the conditions of the Portsmouth Treaty. They felt that they had been disrespected by the West and were continued to be thought of as a second level country. They hungered for international respect and being a seafaring nation, they built a navy that was by all measurement the equal of many of the nations, nations armies or navies from around the world. But they were also a very resource, resource poor nation. And for that reason, they not just desired colonies, but they needed colonies to expand their, their desires for growth. For this, they looked to the mainland. They had already had control of the Korean peninsula since the middle of the 1890s. But they now looked to expand that further into Japan. They set their sights on Manchuria, and in 1931 they would invade Manchuria, taking over and renaming it Manchuko. Japan's desires were not to create a worldwide empire, but a regional hegemony. They wanted to create what would widely become known as the co Greater East Asian Co-Prosperity Sphere, where Japan, at its center, would draw the resources of the region for its own development and strength. Of course, we continue with the problem that Japan had being looked upon as a lesser nation. And as the greater nations of the world, the Western European and the Americans, looked to Japan, they would tend to crush those expansionist feelings and desires by the Japanese. The Japanese would rankle against this for another decade. But in the 1930s, American views were far from international. They were more focused inward. Domestically, the United States had suffered the Great Depression in 1929. Facing desolation in their economy, the Americans suffered through the Depression as the brand new, newly elected Theodore, uh, Franklin Roosevelt, a cousin of Theodore, tried to find ways to re-energize the economy and reassure the people through his fireside chats. Farther in Europe, to the east, the Great Depression had been met in a far more radical way with the fascist governments of Mussolini in Italy and Hitler in Germany. These fascist governments sought to direct their economies and they necessarily grew like a cancer throughout Europe to overtake and destroy the democracies that were there. Democracies that America needed as hosts and partners in their trading sphere. Chief among these was Britain as a friend to America. Besides our common history and language, the United States recognized that Britain was the last bastion of democracy as the fascist nations expanded uncontrollably throughout Europe. This friendship would become a core of the friendship and the unity that would go on to fight in World War II. But in early 1940, the last of the British forces on the continent were in great danger of being wiped out. As the fascist forces, the Nazi forces, drove the British expeditionary force into a tight pocket near Dunkirk, with their backs almost literally up against the wall. It was only through the miracle of Dunkirk, where every floating piece of shipping was able to rescue the British and get them back where the British then hunkered down in grave defiance of Hitler, personified by their Prime Minister, Winston Churchill.
Roosevelt was faced with a dilemma. He needed to protect the European democracies, whatever was left. And yet he was facing a grave economic catastrophe at home with the Great Depression. Somehow there had to be a way to balance the two. And he soon found it. If he could energize American, energize American industry to produce and then provide the, that production to the European nations overseas, the energy would both protect democracies overseas as well as energize the American economy. This became known as the Lend-Lease Program. And although we may quibble over whether or not providing products to communist Russia was protecting the democracies, it was a case of the enemies of my enemies are my friends. And the Russians and the British were the last bastions fighting against the fascist nations. Roosevelt said we must become an arsenal, an arsenal of democracy, as we've talked about here in this room over the past few weeks. Muskegon was at the heart of this. And so the Americans did become the arsenal of democracy, producing weaponry in the air, on land, and in the sea, in numbers so great as to stagger the imagination. This production was not lost on the Japanese. Realizing that they desired to grow, but realizing too that they would continue to be crushed and held in check by the West, they knew that eventually that American manufacturing production giant would be turned against them. Their prime minister, Hideki Tojo, quickly assessed the situation and in 1941 declared, if we don't do something now, we will lose our opportunity to ever do something to break out of being a third class nation. They recognized that the time was now, if they ever had a chance, to establish their power in the Pacific against the other great Pacific power, the United States. In order to establish their hegemony, their co-prosperity sphere. They knew they would have to fight against the Americans. They knew that the Americans were allied with the hated Russians. It was only natural then that the Japanese should turn to the opponents of both the Americans and the Russians. And in 1940, they signed a tripartite pact with the Italians and the Germans establishing the, the, the Axis powers. The Japanese felt, now felt that with this position, aided by their backing of the, by the Germans and the Italians, they could now wreak havoc on the Americans at will in order to establish once and for all Japanese power in the Pacific. The man that they turned to, to design the battle plan, was this man. Izuruku Yamamoto. Yamamoto was a brilliant man. He knew the Americans well. He was well chosen for the task. He had actually served as a naval attache in Washington in the 1920s. He had attended classes at Harvard University. He was fluid in English. He was also against attacking the Americans. He felt that this was a fool's fool's uh, errand to attack such a powerful nation. But he had his orders, and he came up with a strategy by which he thought he might be able to do this. His strategy was a three-step process of first attacking the American fleet at Pearl Harbor, then establishing fortress-like barriers from the Sakhalin Islands in the north down through Midway in the middle, and all the way down to the New Guinea area to the south. Once this fortress-like wall was established, they would consolidate the greater prosperity sphere in the center. As you can see from this three-step process, 
Number two and number three must follow from a successful completion of number one, the attack of the American fleet. The American fleet had relocated to the Hawaiian territories in the late 1930s, early 40s, because of the growing aggression of Japanese power in the Pacific. We were already reading many of their transcripts, secret, broken by our own decryption crews. We knew that they were getting more and more aggressive. And in order to counter this and send a message, the Pacific fleet was moved from the Pacific coast of the United States out to the territories of Hawaii. And there they sat, lined up in Pearl Harbor, sending a message to the Japanese, don't mess with us. Indeed. Yamamoto looked at this condition and looked for an example that he might borrow. And he didn't have to look very far to find one that fit the very model that he was looking for. Port Arthur. <laughs> Why not? And in late November of 1941, shielded by a storm front, Six Japanese aircraft carriers with 340 aircraft sailed within 200 miles of Hawaii before launching their aircraft early on the morning of December 7th. Striking in two waves, the ships lay in the harbor of, Port, uh, of Pearl Harbor, sitting ducks. The attack was brisk, brutal, and devastating. The military portion was well-timed, but there was a second portion. You see, diplomatic protocol required that you declare war before you actually strike. And according to Yamamoto's plans, there should have been a formal declaration of war presented to President Roosevelt, I can't believe this, 30 minutes before the first bombs were to hit. <laughs> 30 minutes. I can't even make it from here to Muskegon High School and guarantee I can make it in 30 minutes. They wanted to guarantee that the strike on Pearl Harbor would be preceded by 30 minutes with a declaration of war presented to the president. Didn't happen. For various reasons, the diplomats, the Japanese diplomats, did not get the presentation of the declaration of war into the White House until two hours later. And by that time, they were shooed out. About two and a half weeks after the attack, General, uh, Admiral Chester Nimitz, the newly assigned commander of the Pacific Fleet, was surveying the wreckage in Pearl. And he was asked by a rather forthright young sailor, well, Admiral, what do you think? And the answer rather amazed the young, young sailor. You know what he said? Admiral Nimitz said, God was taking care of America. He said, say what? Well, Nimitz went on to explain that the Japanese screwed up. You see, they did do a tremendous job blowing our battleships up. However, there were a number of things they screwed up on. First of all, the battleships were sunk in a very shallow harbor. Many of them were sunk in dry docks, and the dry docks weren't destroyed. That meant that every ship, almost every ship, could be resurrected and was, in fact, resurrected, with the notable ex exceptions of the Arizona and the Oklahoma. All the ships were resurrected and put back out to sea and did actually take part in the war. That's the first problem. If they had attacked while the ships were out in the ocean someplace, they never would have been recovered. Of course, that's then a much larger target. But be that as it may, that's the first thing Nimitz said the Japanese screwed up with. The second thing he said was, you know what's right on the other side of that hill over there? The entire oil reserves for the naval fleet. Japanese didn't get them. Now, it was part of their plan. Give them credit for that. It was part of the plan that they were to strike those oil reserves. But as the 
first and second wave returned to the aircraft carriers, the admiral in charge said, no, we've done enough. I'm a little bit concerned about the third reason they didn't completely successfully destroy the fleet. And the third reason, anybody want to take a guess? Anybody know? Yes! The American aircraft carriers were currently out of port. The very weapon that the Japanese used to strike Pearl Harbor, the Americans still had. The American aircraft carriers were ferrying aircraft to, I think, Guam and Midway, and another one was back on the West Coast. All the American aircraft carriers were still intact. They would form the core of the strike force that would return the favor to Japan over the next two and a half years. Yamamoto was no fool. He got the reports back and he said, damn, we didn't get the oil? Damn, we didn't get the aircraft carriers? Damn. Yamamoto had always been a little bit against, oh, a lot against striking the Americans. He knew the resilience of the American spirit. He knew that if you woke this giant, that there would be nothing to stop them. He knew that a quick Sunday knockout punch would work, but not leaving the oil and the, the ships and the aircraft carriers intact. He knew Japan was in trouble. And he reportedly said, I fear we have done nothing more than awaken a sleeping giant. Yeah. The resolve and the anger of the American people was quickly measured by President Roosevelt. And less than 24 hours later, as he stood before Congress, he said those immortal words. You know the words. A day that will live in infamy. And thanks to the Tripartite Act, Germany made it much easier for us. There was no political, well, are we going to uh, help Britain? Uh, how do we? No. Nah. Hitler jumped right in. And on the 11th of December, he stood up in the Reichstag and declared war on the United States for the aggression against Japan. <laughs> All right, Hitler. Let's give him a big hand. And the war had come. So, by way of review, the genesis of Pearl Harbor began in the time of empires. It began with the control of sea lanes, the control and the expansion of colonies. America joined that in 1890. I should say in 1898, with the Spanish-American War, acquiring colonies and having a robust disciple in Theodore Roosevelt to push forward the concepts of controlling those sea lanes. Japan was empowered by the West, encouraged to feel their oats, to show their strength, to act as a surrogate and then grow beyond that by both the British and the Americans. Given a little time to germinate and be ignored by the West under strain, the Japanese moved ahead and recognized that the only way that they could continue was to knock out the only threat they had from an opponent in the Pacific. And hence came the day of infamy. The Imperial Navy was operating under strict silence. The aggression was not specific enough for the Americans to say it will definitely happen on this day at this time. There was certainly the expectation that war would come, but they could not, they did not have the, the data coming through to specifically know that at 7.58 on December 7th, the planes would appear overhead. It has long been a popular conspiracy theory that Franklin Roosevelt knew that the attack was coming. 
and that he let it happen. Keegan does not believe that to be the case. He believes that the information was too nebulous to pin down a specific time. And I would, I, I rest my defense with John Keegan. We knew war was coming. I'm just reading an interesting book, and it's called The United States and Britain and Prophecy. And it yes. talks about all the colonies, it talks about the ceilings, and uh. what they acquired, what you just mentioned. And? Yeah, I know. That's why we study history, guys. <laughs> I've been talking with my, with my high schoolers about why do we study history. Because we take lessons and apply it to what we know today. It's not an exact science. There are lots of parallel universes out there. But just maybe, just maybe, we can get a little insight into what might happen next by looking at what happened in the past. Pearl Harbor, the awakening of a sleeping giant. I have been your host, and what questions do you have? <laughs> yes, sir. I want to know what ticket you're going to run under for the presidency. <laughs> <laughs> I, I got to talk to my manager about that. Had a question over here. Yes, ma'am. Um, how would America have fared um, if the Japanese had gotten our oil reserves? We would have been screwed. <laughs> well, look, you know, we talk about parallel universes. What would have happened? I was just talking to my students about, uh, do you know who Stonewall Jackson was in the Civil War? How he got shot by his own men, died one month before Gettysburg? True story. Finger of God. What would have happened if he had lived? What would have happened if he hadn't gotten shot? What would have happened if they'd gotten our oil reserves? We can, we can imagine. Now, I can tell you that Chester Nimitz said they screwed up because they left us our oil. There were no nuclear aircraft carriers, no nuclear submarines. We needed to have oil in order to protect those sea lanes, to do what Alfred Thayer Mahan said we needed to do. You take away the oil, what happens? We don't have a fleet. What we have are a lot of bobbing corks out in the ocean. We lose the war. We certainly don't put up a defense against the Japanese. We would have to try to extend ourselves from the Pacific coast. Yeah, would have been tough. Huge, tough. Yes. You got to believe that that should have been their primary attack. You know, what, what, what's a comparison? It's, it's, well, like, let's say Putin, President Putin. You can go pop him in the mouth or you can take away all his money. What's going to hurt him more? You know, well, yeah, you know, you want to pop him in the mouth, but if you take, take away his money so he can't function, you would think that the oil would have been something of a similar metaphor. If you take all the oil away so the ships can't run, you don't have to sink the ships. I think Nimitz got it right. God was looking out. You know, whatever divine providence or just dumb plain luck, they didn't hit what could have really hurt us. There was an American destroyer outside of Pearl Harbor, uh, I guess early on the morning, of, or late on the 6th? Yeah. And tensions were high. And yes, they did drop depth charges on the submarine. Okay, my other question is, is had the uh, declaration of war reached D.C. in time, um, would Pearl Harbor not seem so much as a surprise attack? Less likely to use atomic weapons on Japan. Oh my. 
It's quite a jump. Did you hear the question over here? He said, if the Japanese had not been so insidious to sneak attack us in 1941, would that have changed Truman's decision to drop the atomic bomb in 1945? <clears throat> no. No, absolutely not. Truman was asked to the end of his life in 1969, said, would you have done it? Now, consider the, he said, yes, I would have. Consider the circumstances of the atomic bomb, and we're getting way off the subject. But the atomic bomb was dropped in, an, in a situation where the United States was preparing to do a Normandy on Honshu, the island of Japan. They were estimating a million American casualties. They were estimating at least a million Japanese casualties and probably more because of Bushido. You know, the, if you played video games where you play samurais, that's Bushido. They expected every man, woman, child, any little, you know, three-year-old with a, with a Ginsu knife coming after the Americans. It was going to be brutal. A minimum of two to three million deaths. And all of a sudden they said, um, Mr. Truman, now that you're president, we can tell you about this project we got going on. They thought that it would be a huge bang and nothing much more. They didn't know about radiation. And frankly, they thought that it might detonate and cause the entire atmosphere of the Earth to combust. <laughs> Bummer. Good news, bad news. War is over. No Earth to come back to. But no, no, he did it because... 240,000 Japanese in Hiroshima and another 100,000 in Nagasaki seemed like a better balance than two to three million deaths in a brutal slogging battle across Japan, which, by the way, probably would have caused me not to be here tonight because my dad was supposed to be in that invasion force. My mom and dad were on their honeymoon in Pearl Harbor. Yeah. We have time for one more question. Okay. Okay, ma'am, ma'am, please. Do you think it's important, very important, for these young students to realize what could be ahead of us with Putin and Russia and his aggressiveness? Could he be another Hitler? Munich, 1938. She's asking, is it important for the young people, for any of us, to know what might be ahead in a parallel universe with Putin? You guys know, Cham uh, you know uh, Munich, 1938, Chamberlain, Peace in Our Time? It may be a leap. It is a parallel universe. It's one of the possibilities. Consider it. Sure. Yeah. Ron, just thank you again for rescheduling, for being considerate of your time and giving us a great education.